Good morning and a warm welcome to all. It's a moment of uh, extreme pleasure to welcome you all for the annual lecture series 2021 from MSAJA. On behalf of uh, Mohammed Satak AJ Academy of Architecture, I, Architect Purchalvi, the moderator for this lecture, extend a warm welcome to our speaker, our lecturer, our Dean and Advisor, Professor Mohammed Harris, our Principal, Professor Mohammed Idris, our HOD and Convener, Professor Satish Kumar, our Design Chair, Professor Abdus Samar, fellow architects, faculty members, and students. We are grateful to Architecture for accepting our invitation for being the speaker of today's webinar on the topic Architecture of Healing Spaces. On that note, uh, let me give a, a brief about our speaker today. Akhirik Sharad graduated as uh, BR from SAP Chennai in 1988 and his MR in Masters in Building Engineering Management from SPA Delhi in 1990. The early milestones in his architectural journey embraced Mr. Harigaran and Associates and uh, Mr. Vergi Zuman and Associates. In 1990, after his Masters, he gained his project management experience from uh, India Habitat Center Delhi and uh, Tech Service Maxworth Home Limited in Chennai. In January 1999, he started his own architectural firm, Design Tech, and uh, since then, progressing successfully every year with a large number of architectural and interior design works for residents, office, farmhouses, hospitals, exhibition complex, restaurants, and industrial projects. To uh, name a few from his long list of his projects are the Kodisha Trade uh, Complex and uh, Co India Convention Center in Pandapu. The Tex Valley Eero that was one on a competition basis, Dr. Uh, Kamakshi Memorial Hospital in Chennai, uh, Dr. Arvind Hospital in Kanyakumari, and also many industrial and commercial projects like uh, uh, Ransar Industries, a uh, private limited factory building, the CRI uh, steel foundry, Opel, uh, CRI pumps, Chola pumps, and Pandutu, uh, uh, and educational institutions such as uh, Railtech Engineering College in Avadi. Uh, Arts College for uh, Aspon uh, Educational Trust in Chennai, along with other uh, independent houses and residences, farmhouses, uh, low cost housing, and the uh, list goes on. Uh, Architect Sharath is also closely associated with uh, academic activities and uh, is a regular visiting faculty with SAP Chennai since uh, 2000 and is currently also the external member on the BRC and MR thesis review committee. He also visits uh, many colleges as external design examiner for uh, BR program. Uh, warm welcome once again, sir. This uh, today's webinar will focus on the planning and uh, design of healthcare spaces. We appreciate your questions and doubts at the end of the presentation or in the chat box. Without uh, consuming any time, I would like to uh, spotlight Architect Sharad to start with this presentation and inspire uh, us with his experience and expertise. Uh, the screen is yours, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Jelvi. Yes, yeah, firstly, I'd love to thank uh, the College uh, Academy for having me here, giving me the opportunity to participate and share my views with an elite gathering. Okay, without any further ado, let's go on to the presentation. Yes, sir. Okay. Yes, sir. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, I am really happy to be here to share my views on uh, healthcare design. The, top, the topic was chosen to be uh, as a current topic, because I think we are going through a very tough time with the pandemic having taken over the world. And it has actually shown us how we lack in our healthcare facilities, both in terms of quantity and quality. Okay? So I, I had an option of presenting either this or uh, an industrial kind of facility with large span structures, exhibitions, etc. And we decided jointly with the uh, the management to do this as a current topic. Uh, the target population that I'm addressing here is, I think, uh, mostly third and fourth year, generally students as a whole. So I would not go into too much of uh, technical details. So that's why I confine my presentation only to planning and design of healthcare spaces. Though I will touch on services, it may not be in detail. Okay. So moving on. To what it contains. Okay, the content of today's presentation will be first of all the standards and planning parameters, which all of us should know uh, in order to design a proper healthcare facility. Then I'll go on to four of my case studies, which are projects done by us at various points of time. Uh, the first project, Kamachi Memorial, was done in the second year of my practice, and subsequently we did we went on to do many other hospitals. Progressively, you will see how. 
we improved our design itself. Not that we were very good at the beginning. Okay, so it's a learning curve, and we improved it stage by stage. Okay, before we go on to the actual presentation, I'd like to tell you the hospital building or a healthcare facility is the most difficult. Some people say, and some people say it is the most easiest. How can this paradox be? Okay, most hospitals are planned based on certain standards and proximities, which are prefixed. In fact, uh, there are computer programs which can actually give you a layout of a hospital very easily once you feed the parameters in. It is so easy to prefix and do the design. But the other side of it is, if you don't know this, the standards and the planning parameters which go into designing a hospital, it can become a nightmare, both for you and for the person who uses the hospital. So that, that having said that, we'll go on to the actual presentation. First, we go into the standards and planning parameters. Any, any building typology has these kind of standards and planning parameters. We'll go through and see how this influences your design or what you should know before you start your design. Okay. Any, any project, uh, once uh, the project is given to you, either as a client or a class exercise, there is a land area which is given. First of all, to understand how it relates to your project. Okay. So in case of hospitals, there are standards which tell you for so-and-so number of beds, 100 beds, 0.5 hectare or 1.25 acres, 100 to 200 beds, it's about 2.5 acres, and 500 beds and above, it is 6.5 hectares. So you can, at the initial stage, tell somebody possible to do 100 beds, possible to do 200 beds or no. So this is a very, very primary prerequisite to know about that. So having understood what constitutes the number of beds to land, then we go on to see number of beds to area of the building, the total built up area. How does that work? In general hospital, the standards are roughly 80 to 85 square meters and goes up to 1000 square meters per bed, depending on whether it's a teaching hospital, what kind of facilities are. So if you have a hundred bedded hospital, it will roughly be about one lakh square feet. Okay, into 1,000 square feet, 1 lakh square feet of space that you require for the hospital. This is not only for the bed space. It includes all the other services, whether it's hospital services, engineering services. The entire gamut of designing a hospital will fall under this category. So we know the land area requirement and how it relates to per bed. And we know the plinth area requirement of the total hospital and how it relates to per, per bed. So these are the two primary characteristics that you should know before you start any hospital, okay? So this standard, please put it into your head, whoever is designing hospitals has to have this primarily at the initial stage, okay? Having understood what land we have and total area we're gonna build on it, okay? Then we go on to see what are the aspects that go into a hospital, okay? The hospital cons consists of various different types of space. I will come to that later, but there are standards for these. In a particular hospital, if you want to understand how many operation theaters are supposed to be there, there are standards which say 50 general beds. For every 50 general beds, one, one uh, OT. For every 25 surgical beds, one OT. But through my presentation, you will understand what is the general bed and the surgical bed. Okay? Similarly, ICUs, five to 10%. Floor space for ICU is a certain number. So this particular sheet gives us norms of detailing space requirement for each zone of a hospital. So from the land area, we went on to have a total built up area. And from there, we can go on to each department and identify these are the kind of facilities to be provided for this size of a hospital for which this area is required. So these are standards which are readily available and can be implemented at a very initial stage. We don't need to sit and calculate detailed areas after the design. So this gives you a fair idea of how to go about classifying the various areas of the hospital, right? Okay, so having now found out the total area, the total land area, and each of those spaces which we are going to design, what constitute those spaces? We go into the planning aspects of a hospital, which most people should know. Okay, there are basic minimum requirements, like the height of the floor. The height of the floor should be a basic minimum of 3.6 meters. Originally, uh, we had a 
uh, we had a norm in, in our uh, CMGA regulations, which had a building height of 15 uh, meters for a G plus three structure. You couldn't exceed 15 meters, okay? But there was a rider clause which, all, which said, except for hospital buildings, you could go up to 17.5, okay? Why? The hospital buildings require larger height for running services so that they become functionally more efficient. Okay, so that's why the height factor is very important. Don't forget to do the exact height for a hospital because then the place becomes usable. Next is the circulation areas. In hospitals, circulation is primary. Various types of circulations are there, but horizontal and vertical circulations are what we are going to deal with right now. The horizontal circulation is through corridor space. So you need to have a minimum of three meters. As per our standards, they say 2.4 meters, which should be sufficient. But three would be ideal, depending on the site, the actual area you're building, this would vary. Okay? So you need to have two stretches crossing each other. That's the high idea of having a three meter or 2.5 meter corridor width. So having said that, the other circulation is the vertical circulation. Today, people move on in lifts and staircases, but in emergencies, ramps are supposed to be provided. It's a norm to provide ramps in all hospitals. You cannot do without it. So Good standard, say one is to 15 is the slope that we need to do. Okay. But uh, due to space constraints, sometimes we pull it back to one is to 12 or one is to 10, which is difficult, but that's the norm that we tend to follow. This is where we really compromise depending on the size of land, size of hospital, etc. But normally it's one is to 15 or more for ease of movement. Okay. So that those are primary areas for general uh, circulation in a hospital and the standards that you need to follow for that. Now we go on to actually what constitutes a hospital in terms of function. Okay? Broadly, we can divide a hospital into four main zones. The outpatient department, I think all of you would know outpatient department handles people coming from outside on a daily basis. They come in to check themselves, find out what is the problem with them. If they get treated, they go away for the day. If the problem is a little serious, they get admitted. So that goes on to the inpatient. Okay? So the outpatient is the first area. The inpatient is the second area where you get, once you get admitted, you go into an inpatient ward, which means it can be a general ward or a common ward. A common ward is where a lot of people are put together in one hall with common facilities. A general uh, 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 private ward is where you have shared facilities like two in one or a single room. Etc. So having these primary areas, then comes the medical zone, medical part of it. These are the areas where the patients are handled. Then comes the medical part of it. The outpatient also has something called an emergency of casual. Okay? The emergency of casualty, as you all know, is the first entry for immediate attention. Supposing there's an accident, they are taken there. They don't go to the outpatient, they go to the emergency, directly get, uh, get dealt with, and whatever has to be done will be done. Then we move on to the diagnostics and treatment, okay? The diagnostics is finding out what is wrong with the patient. This can mean blood tests, it can mean other tests, it can mean scans, x-rays. So these are oriented towards understanding what is the problem for a particular patient. Okay? So that becomes the third major portion. Then the fourth major portion is the OT itself, the op operation theater area where the final treatment or uh, invasive treatments are carried out. These are done in the OT, and the support facilities for this area are the ICU, uh, the CSSD, and other space. So they are actually divided into four or five broad zones, outpatient, inpatient, diagnostics, OT. You can also classify the emergency as a broad. Having understood this, then we move on to the movement through a hospital. You enter. This is where you enter the reception and register yourself. Admit card is given. And you also have the medical records, et cetera, in this space. So you can pull it out anytime you want, and a new patient or an old patient. Then you move on to the outpatient department. Okay. So if the outpatient department decides you move to the inpatient and you have to get admitted, you move on to the inpatient department. Between these two are this facility, which is useful for both. You have to access this facility from both areas, the inpatient areas and the outpatient areas. So this becomes a major chunk of um, 
a medical facility. The diagnostics happen over here. People will access it from outside as well as from inside. So you should understand that part of it in the hospital very clearly. Then from the inpatient, you move on to more serious areas or sterile areas like the OPs, the surgery, all those form in place, which are the most innermost sanctuary of the hospital. And once you finish your treatment, either from the outpatient or the inpatient, you are discharged. Then you go out, buy medicine and move away. So this central area is where there is a lot of movement for people who come in and go out of a hospital and inpatient. This is exclusively for outpatient and inpatient. And then you have a OT segment, which is a serious segment inside of us. So I will not go into details of the inpatient, outpatient, etc. Now we move on to dependency. What is this dependency? Okay. You understand, you understood these various zones. Each zone caters to a particular type of patient, a particular time limit the patient is going to be there, and what they do in those zones. From here, we move on to dependency for these broad zones. I'm not even talking about details. These broad four or five zones, if you understand, I think you can design, design the basic concept of a hospital properly. Okay? So that's where we will actually work with today. So you have this OPD, operation theater, ICUs, etc. So let's take the OPD. This is advice connection would mean it can be there, it need not be there, it can be far away, but it has to be dependent to a certain extent. So OP and ICU, supposing somebody in the OP has to get immediate treatment, he has to be moved to the ICU, but it won't be such an emergency. Okay? They move in as and when something happens, they will move the patient over there. Similarly, OP, the maternity unit, part of the OP, usually part of the OP, sometimes this maternity unit is separated, so people will be taken over there in case of a mild emergency. Operation theater becomes a major aspect in your design. Okay? If you don't understand an operation theater, its location, its biosecurity, then we are in a tough situation. That's why these slides are the basis for your understanding of the hospital. The operation theater has to be very close. See, very short time period, very close to the ICU. Because the ICU patient will go up to the operation theater or after the operation theater, he might end up at the ICU. So there's an interdependency over there. The operation theater has to be directly linked to sterilization because most of the activities inside the operation theater are dependent on sterilization and sterile equipment, sterile store, sterile material, etc. The operation theater also tends to be closer to the maternity. Sometimes they have a separate operation theater in the maternity space in large hospitals. Otherwise, they are taken to the main operation theater. So the proximity should be easily accessible. So that is very important. Because the emergency, yes, it is to be accessible, but it may not be right next to it. So it can be further off, but direct access without going into other areas has to be provided. Short and useful connection, it says. Short, yes. Useful, it says, because they have to be attended to immediately. Sometimes they have to be operated upon. So they move to the operation center. Laboratories also directly connected. If they need some biopsy done of a certain organ or a tissue, they need to send it and get it back immediately. To do those kind of things, the laboratory has to be. Similarly, the ICU has connectivity with the sterilization area, emergency, etc. But the dependency is not very great. Okay, so. This gives you a fair idea of the broad zoning and its interconnectivity. With this, you can play around and locate your broad zones to be easily accessible, to be functionally correct, and the dependency factor has to be taken. So that's something that you need to know primarily before you start designing. All these things we need to know primarily before we start designing. So we go on to the next slide. So now we go on to some of the departments where I thought you should know in some detail how we handle those departments and the same kind of activity and proximity in those departments. So the outpatient departments of all of you know has to have people coming in from outside and they're getting attended to on a daily basis and examination, etc. etc. with the diagnostics as part of the outpatient department. Okay? So that's what happens in an outpatient department. Follow-up of treatment also, they come on a certain basis like dialysis patients, people come to find out 
uh, other um, aspects of uh, the, the clinical aspects of what is going wrong with them. And then once it's corrected, they are supposed to test and get. So all that happens in an OP. OP generally consists of the first area where you go after the reception. It has a set of consultancy rooms. So this, if we can blow this up a little bit, let me try doing that for you. Okay. So the OP is directly linked to the main entry. There is a waiting space after the reception and you get into the OP, you have a, less, a, a line of consultancy rooms of various types of consultants. General consultancy are op, ophthalmology, ENT, dentistry and all those. There are specialist consultants also, but they may not be sitting as part of the OP. They will be in their own departmental areas. If they find in this consultancy that you need a specialist consultant, you will be sent over there. So this is more towards general OP, medical OP. Okay? So after you do consultancy, they send you to treatment areas, which are the orange areas, which are meant for treatment, where you don't get the treatment done in the consultancy room. Nurses do these uh, injection, dressing, all that is done in the treatment areas. The support facilities are for the nurses who look after the space. They have their own uh, departments and areas, dirty and clean utility, and other staff facilities are there. So this constitute a single unit. If you need more numbers, you just extend it vertically up or you extend it horizontally and make units and then link it up. Okay? Depending on the numbers, these get amplified. So that's the basic OT layout, I mean, or OPD layout for you. The understanding over here is this is a public zone. Anybody can enter. It is the less sterile zone because you cannot stop people from coming in and going out. So the sterility is low. So that's to be understood when you design. So these are two key factors you should understand when designing OPD. Accessibility and the sterility is going to be lesser than normal. So you can't have specialized sterile areas into these kind of areas. Okay, then we go on to the IP department. As we said, they get admitted into the hospital. That's when you are called an inpatient. You get admitted, okay? And then you go to the wards. Various types of wards are the common wards, not very expensive. So people go there. They're, it's a shared facility, let's say 10, 20 beds for a large hall with their own toilets, etc. So they, they classified into two, medical and surgical. Medical wards are normal treatments where you get attended to fever, some uh, other uh, treatment which can be done without invasive surgery. All that is done through the medical team. Surgical wards are for people who need surgery. They are at, put in surgical wards because they need a little more special care, pre and post operative care. So they put into surgical wards. So it can be classified male, female. There's a maternity ward. It usually is kept separate because I think the people who are involved in this are specialized. Both the doctors and the patients need to be taken care of differently. So there's a separate ward. There's a pediatric ward. Again, specialized care for children. Nursery for neonatal and babies. And an isolation ward. See, this is very important. Most hospitals do have an isolation ward, which don't work very great. Okay. Today's conditions have taught us isolation is a major factor in hospitals. So an isolation ward is a place where you Keep patients isolated who are actually going to be spreading something, okay, spreading infection, etc. So you isolate them, keep them in a special place so they don't spread the infection to the best of your risk. So that's a very important portion of most. All the other wards are depending on where and when, which kind of hospital, emergency ward, burn ward. Not many hospitals have this. Orthopedic ward, yes, they have. Post operative will be part of the OP. So that's your internal layout. Okay. Having said those, I'm not going into detail here because I think you know to design rooms and design large rooms for accommodating 10 beds. It's like doing a hotel. What's the difference between a hotel and a hospital? Hotel is where people go out of their own this thing. They want to stay there and they want to have, spend some time. It's more recreational. A hospital is more need-based. It's more functional. It's a medical need. But the rooms are very similar in layout. What you provide in the rooms become different, which we'll go into later. Okay, departmental layout for an ICU. Now we have moved on from the IP into an ICU. ICU is a more specialized sterile zone. The IP was not a sterile zone where people are there, visitors come. So it's also a semi-sterile or least sterile zone. The ICU is a highly sterile zone. 
So what happens in these areas? Patients are kept there for special monitoring. They need special care like ventilators, oxygen. They are monitored the whole time through some machines as to their condition, right? So usually you have restricted entry. Okay, visitors and patients are allowed from here. There will be a space where visitors are allowed till further on. They may not be allowed depending on the visiting time. Sometimes the hospitals do allow that. So the patients come in, the beds are arranged in this greenish blue color. Then there is a staff station. This is the nurse's station. Generally in ICUs, nurses' numbers are higher. So you need to have larger nurses' station and their visibility to all the beds has to be perfect. They are the ones monitoring the patient and the equipment. So they should be in visual connectivity with all these places. The nurses' station have a support facility. Usually it contains medical records and medical supplies. Sir, I just want to know how I um, Sorry. Yeah. Medical uh, facilities and medical supplies and medical records are kept over here. So usually it is divided into two zones, dirty and clean. So the dirty zone contains everything after the patient is treated, all that, and those wastes go into a dirty zone separately. The clean zone has all, I mean, uh, sterile stores, all those things are in the clean zone. Every single floor in your hospital has to have these two zones, dirty and clean utilities. And ICUs are specifically very, uh, it's a need-based thing. Okay? So you have two ICUs, maybe you can add one, you can add one, depending on how many you need. So the numbers we found out is 10% of the total bed capacity of a hospital should be an ICU capacity. Okay? But in today's pandemic, we ran out of ICU beds. So how do we address that? Let's see later. We cannot give solutions, but yes, we have to address these issues. Okay, after the ICU becomes the most important place, the operation theater, the users here are the patients that are brought here, the doctors will be here, the nurses will be here, and attenders will be here. Apart from the users, they need a lot of other facilities to be connected to them. The ICU, the uh, CSSD, the gas supply, all these have to be connected into this area and becomes the heart of the entire uh, hospital in terms of treatment major treatments happening. Okay. Generally, this zone is known as a highly sterile zone. But inside the zone itself, you have just outside is a non-sterile zone. Inside the zone itself, you have a dirty zone. Okay, So understand this. Inside the sterile zone, there is a dirty zone. How do we go about it? We'll see in the next slide. Then you have a semi-sterile where the patient passes through from a non-sterile into a semi-sterile. And finally, into a sterile zone before he enters the OT. The OT is completely sterile. Okay, so there is a sequence of movement. Is what you have to understand and how people move in terms of patient, staff, material. Everything has to move properly. Otherwise, you will contaminate this area. So this understanding has to be pakka before you start a hospital. All the rest of the areas, I went very, very... Uh, um, very, very less into it, but this you must understand before you do a hospital because primary areas are these. Okay, so how do you lay out a OT complex or OT floor? Okay, this is just one of the possible uh, this criteria that, that's considered. This is a general corridor from which things move in, people move in, doctors move in, nurses move in, everybody moves in from this zone, this orange color zone. Okay, then the doctors and staff move in directly from a non-sterile area. They walk through into this zone, which is actually the place where they change into sterile gowns. They wash, they gown themselves, clean up, and then move on to a sterile zone. See how it is indicated. They come in and then go into a sterile zone. And they come in and go outside also. So the movement is from a non-sterile into a sterile after the wash. Many cases, the designs, Make it look as if they come in and go out and then walk through this. It doesn't work. Okay? So this is how it should be laid out for NABH norms. Otherwise, you will not get accredited by NABH. Okay? Similarly, uh, staff, nurse, all of them move into this area. A patient moves in from a separate corridor. It's a separate entry. He is brought into a pre-operative zone. They are kept in waiting or hold. Sometimes anesthesia happens over here. Sometimes it doesn't, okay? Then they move into this. This is all sterile. So once they are into it, they are sterile. And then they move into the various operation theaters. There is an anti-space here for anesthesia, induction, all that can happen. Patients move in 
anesthetize and then go in. Okay? The doctors come in, get into the sterile areas, come here, there is a scrub up finally before they move into the OT. So they are completely into a clean room environment over here. Though all of this is clean room, this is the cleanest space over here. Okay? So that's the sequence of movement. After operation, the patient is moved into these waiting areas. Okay, so this is post-operative recovery, second stage recovery, and then they move out into the general spaces for the war. Okay. This is people movement. How does uh, material move? You need sterile material. There is dirty material which is generated inside the OT. How do they move? Okay. So generally, the operation theater has a rear side axis. Usually, there's a dirty corridor over here. This is not very uh, uh, clearly earmarked in this particular diagram. It's showing a sterile stock, okay? The sterile areas, the stores, the sterile CSSUs are separately placed. Usually, a centralized location from which you bring in the sterile equipment and a sterile uh, things like bandages, sheets, etc. Through a, through a drum waiter or a lift and then enter the sterile zone. You have to have a sterile store from where they are distributed into the OT. Then the dirty equipment and dirty instrumentation, dirty linen, all that gets taken out over here, down through a dirty lift into the CSST zone, and they get processed over there. Okay? So that's usually how it happens. So it's moving from a clean to a dirty zone for material and uh, from a dirty to a clean zone for people. Okay? So it's very, very important to understand this layout. It can be done in many ways, but this is the primary way you have to handle it in terms of movement. Yes, having taken you through the four major zones in a hospital, we will just look at the services what go into a hospital. Okay, this is broad. I'm not going to go into detail, but the understanding has to be there. So what services go into a hospital? There are usually, I uh, in my presentation, say two types of services. One is engineering services. The other is medical services. But today I actually subdivided it further. There is administrative services, which deals with admin, both front end and back end, okay? They need some space. They should be a front end space where they meet up with people. There's a back end space where activities like accounting, other things go on, pharmaceutical stores, et cetera, okay? Then there is engineering services. Most of you are aware of what the engineering services are. In a hospital, it consists of the usual things, electrical, plumbing, all those things, plus medical gas and other things which are needed specifically for a hospital, bio waste, morgue, and all those. Then there is, in the medical services, uh, there are two types. One is the medical services directly accessible for doctors and patients. So the non-clinical services like the kitchen, etc. Take kitchen, laundry, all those things become non-clinical services. Okay, the kitchen is one of the primary uh, non-clinical services. I'm not going to go into the kitchen layout, though it's over here. We will skip on and go to the laundry. The laundry is another non-clinical service. You can understand this very easily, not going to go through it. CSS, very important to understand. Like I told you, most of the materials from the ICU, rooms, OT, all come into the centralized sterile supply department. Okay? Everything comes in, gets cleaned, gets sterilized, gets packed, and then it's sent back to the various areas. So again, there is a singular movement which is required like in an OT, okay? Let's understand that. Okay? So broad zoning, soiled the linen and soiled uh, instrument, etc., come into the soiled zone. From here, they are cleaned and taken to a clean zone. They are packed after cleaning and then put it in a sterile zone. This is material ready to go out. This is where the cleaning and packing happen. This is where the dirty things come in, okay? A detail of this is shown here. Things are brought in either through trolley or people manually. Trolley is dumped here. Trolley is washed and goes away. And here it collects clean material after it becomes clean. Here the material comes in. All the things are washed and disinfected and sterilized over here. And then passed on to the control area where it is handled by staff and cleaned, etc. Staff as a separate entry, they have to clean themselves before they come in. They should also be sterile. They should be disinfected. They come in, change, and then they move in. From here, it goes to a sterile store. Material passes only through hatches, through intermediate connecting areas, so that it doesn't get sterilized, I mean, disinfected, infected. Then it gets 
issued from here through the trolley and goes back. So that is your uh, zoning and the circulation for a PSSC movement. It goes to various parts of your hospital. Okay, mortuary, not in detail, but yes, the mortuary is to be provided, not too close, not too far away from the hospital, slightly discreet so that people don't get into a problematic uh, situation. Medical, general medical stores are there, like the pharmacy, etc. Then you have storages for vaccines, like what happened now. These are kept in cold storage rooms because they are controlled atmosphere. Then there's a medical gas supply. They need oxygen. There is nitrous oxide. For They need vacuum. All these are in, in, in requirements. On the rooms, they don't give nitrous oxide. It's only for anesthesia. The vacuum is given in the rooms as well as in uh, OTs. All these have to be provided in certain zones. But today's pandemic has actually taught us a little more. It's not only in certain areas. This has to be almost now sent to the entire hospital and all beds. Okay, so now we have understood or we have found out what constitutes a hospital broadly in terms of areas, functions, dependency, all that has come about. Okay? Um, should, we, should we take questions on this right now or should we go on to the next? Guys? Nice. So? Should we take questions on this portion right now or should we go on to the next? No, at the end we'll ask soon. Or uh, if the participants want to ask, we can ask. Uh, yeah, yeah. This this stage, if they have doubts, we'll clear it up here if they want to. Just five minutes, we'll give them. Yeah, okay, sir. Uh, participants can uh, unmute themselves and uh, if you uh, have any questions, you may ask. So you can ask anything, don't worry, okay? I, uh, if you don't ask, then I'm assuming that you've understood the whole thing, basically. Participants, you may unmute yourself and you may ask. Or if you want, you may put it in the chat box. Yeah, do that, do that. Put it in the chat box so you can ask. If you have nothing, you tell, uh, uh, you tell us that you have nothing, we can go ahead. That leather one that's it. Yeah, uh, after this pandemic, the norms must, must be changed. So how will yeah, it be? I, I, think, I think we'll address that. I have a last slide. We'll address that. Okay. Yeah. Good. That's a good point yeah. uh, that you made, whoever it is. I think they'll be uh, putting in the chat box. Yeah, yeah. Chat box. yeah. yeah. Uh, share the slides in the group. Yeah, that we'll do. Yeah. <laughs> okay, good, good, good. One more is come. Yeah, uh, considering the pandemic situation, how far the circulation needs to be considered? Okay, I think uh, the circulation doesn't change too much, okay? Uh, the question of isolation comes about, yes? Circulation will remain the same because we are already isolating people. A good hospital design already isolates people, okay? That's the, that's the great thing about the functionality. You're isolating. This slide will tell you how that happens. Okay, so we'll go on to this slide after the thing, and I'll tell you how that happens. Any more questions? Okay, we'll go on. Don't worry. You yeah. can always ask. You can always ask at the end of the session. Okay, no problem. Okay, this this particular slide tells tells you uh, how to approach a design in terms of zoning. Again, not detailed zoning. It tells us how to approach the design in terms of zoning, where uh, you can, um, wait, let me stop this video. So now, um, the broad zones that we discussed about were OP, IP, diagnostics, uh, operation theater, and emergence, okay? How do we work for this? Somebody asked how, about circulation, okay? So this is, isolation is what is the key word over here in a hospital and in other buildings to a certain extent, you don't need people going to areas that they don't have to access. That is your first criteria, especially in hospital design. Okay, So you start cutting off people wherever they have to be. So the lesser number of people going to those uh, uh, private areas, the better. So in this case, how do we define those areas? Uh, in normal buildings, you define them as what? Public, semi-public, and private, right? But here, apart from that, we are looking at public, semi-public, private. 
least sterile, moderately sterile, and most sterile. So that is a key thing in planning hospitals. Okay. So as a plan, a horizontal zoning, the area you see around, which is the periphery of the building, assuming the building is a circle, the periphery of the building, the outermost surface of the building will be the public space because everybody has to access these spaces from the outside. And it is the least sterile. Why it's the least sterile? People are coming in and going out as one. Secondly, the atmospheric conditions are directly in connect with this area. So this is the least sterile in terms of control. Okay, you really can't control it uh, easily unless you do extra effort. So we try to provide all the least areas, least sterile areas and the public areas on the periphery. The next zone, which is a little more protected zone, we will start doing the semi-public areas. The semi-public areas are more to do with people come and do dialysis and stay there for a day and go back. The IP wards and the IP rooms are the semi-public areas because not everybody can walk in. Only patients who are admitted can go in. Visitors can come in. So it is semi-public. Okay, It is not completely private zone and it's not completely public zone. You are controlled over here. That is a moderately sterile area because People are coming in and going out. It is disinfected over a period of time, but not to the extent that other areas are going to be. And the third zone is private. I call it private because it's easy to understand, but it's a highly sterile area. Okay? These are consists of the OT, the ICU, and the surgical ward. Okay? So these completely are controlled environment. You have no choice. You can't say, I will have an OT with the natural ventilation. You can't say, I will have an OT which has windows openable, I want to be able to eat, uh, breathe the uh, fresh air. Okay, So people will not, uh, the, the norms don't accept it and the functionality doesn't accept it. Okay? So generally, these are highly controlled areas. So as a horizontal or a planning exercise, outermost, maybe intermediate, innermost. These are the zones. So this is how you isolate people. Circulation, we will come to, but isolation is the key word over here. Okay? Then, uh, this is the vertical zoning. I'm sorry, the text is interchanged. This is the horizontal zoning and this is the vertical zoning. In vertical zoning, same thing again. At the ground level, you have easy public access. The basement is the next level of easy access and the first floor. Usually in hospitals, these floors are given over to OP and other uh, diagnostic facilities. Mostly basements will have diagnostic facilities. The ground floor will have... Uh, uh, reception, men, admittance, OPs and all that. The OP goes to the first floor also. The emergency also is in the ground floor. Okay? Then you go to the next zone, which is the moderate zone. The moderate zone should have the IP and the wards. This is private in the sense it can be private for the visit. people who admit it. They don't need to have people walking through their rooms unnecessarily. And the visitors only can access them. Doctors and nurses, of course, access all zones. Then the topmost zone, Again, you're moving it to the top, the sterile zones, OT, all that goes on top, ICUs, etc. So it works that way, but it does not mean it has to be done only that way. Let's see how we went about doing it in our designs, but this becomes primarily how you approach a hospital in terms of zoning. Okay, so isolation in terms of people getting segregated, isolation in terms of atmospheric conditions, and infections getting segregated. Okay, so those are the key terminologies of the term. If you've understood that, we move on to the case studies itself, or not case studies, projects that we have done. I've chosen four of the many projects in the hospital we have done for certain reasons. Okay, the Kamakshi Memorial Hospital had two phases. It's in Palikarne. Uh, the first phase was a very, uh, very linear, long property. It had 100 bed as a requirement. It, it was only plot at that time and the second plot was not even available with the, with the client. So that's why it was the first phase. The second phase came in a little later once we started constructing this. They bought the other land and they changed their idea. So we did the second phase also. So these are 100 beds and 130 beds. It is located in Pali Karnai inside the marsh area. It was, the land was part of the marsh. Okay. How, how um, this is the location itself. Let me show you the location so you can understand the context. Okay, that's the location. Uh, this is the Belicheri Tambaram Road, which is uh, called the, uh, the Tambaram Main Road. 
there is this the radial radial ring road connecting from uh, somewhere on the uh, OMR. OMR it starts connecting from the uh, there's a college over there. It's not Guru Nanak. Some other college is there. It comes through, crosses underneath the flyover and goes towards Tambaram on this side. Okay. So the property is the corner site. The building over here is the first phase which we already had constructed. The picture was taken after this was done. And this is the land for the second phase. Okay. Like I told you, all this is marshland. This was part of the marshland, but it was sold out. I do not know uh, uh, what control they had, but it was completely in the marsh, which was a big challenge. Okay. The good thing about the site was it had long side facing north and south and roads on two sides. So it was very easy to take care of energy, lighting, all those kind of things. Okay. From here, we go on to the actual design. How did we approach the design? Okay, this is both phases put together for you to understand the layout. I'll go on to the first phase later. So this was the first phase. Look at the linearity of the property. The property here was totally 100 feet only. And property here must have been a little more than that. With six meter setbacks, we had hardly anything left in the building. So it was, a, it was not an easy building to design, even as a normal building, but it's a hospital, even more difficult. Okay, how did we approach it? I will tell you. The second phase was a larger property. But it became a separate uh, building for reasons other than architecture. Move on. The first phase, the site itself was given to us, a linear site. How do we approach the, zone, uh, the design itself? Very, very simple in this case, not a great property. So first we did the setbacks on all sides and put the outline of the building, six meter setbacks. All sides, the red became the outline, very linear. A tapering facade, otherwise very linear block. Then what we did, we said, okay, the eastern end, the building became too narrow. It became hardly, hardly about 10 feet over here. I couldn't even accommodate a corridor and a, and a room. So then we decided to curtail the built form or the footprint still further and brought it down. The yellow is the footprint now. Okay. And then having done this, we said, how do we work this building in terms of the functionality? Primary functionality, like I told you, circulation, isolation, all these things have to be taken care of. Right at this stage, we decided that by doing three cores for this building, the entire length was nearly about uh, 160 to 170 uh, meters. So three cores were given, dividing the, word, the horizontal zones into four zones. So how did we do it? We had a circulation port, another circulation port. So anybody who accesses the building from this side can go in up through this. They access it from this side, they go up through this. But this also became the service port, toilet, HUs, electrical rooms, all were located in these two. The third one was primarily a circulation port for movement up and down. Okay? So we split that entire linear building into four zones horizontally. Okay? And then we went on to work on the section. And like we told you, we wanted all the public areas down here. We wanted the moderate uh, semi-private areas here and the operation theater and the, and the sterile zones up there. Okay? Having said that, we decided to have the emergency over here because the width over here was good enough to put in an emergency along with its needs like diagnostics, etc. The width became very narrow over here. The main entry was here. The first drop off is the emergency and people tend to go around and come here. Okay. And then exit. That was the first phase. So having put the emergency over here, we then decided that, yes, how to reach the OT. Either here or here would be the ideal because I come out, take my core and move vertically up and land up at my OT. So this is a primary requirement in planning. The OT should be accessible without going through other areas from the emergency. Side. Okay. Then we had the ICU on top of it. Small segments. We don't have large segments in the building because the building itself is small. So the ICU became the next segment. Above that, we had deluxe rooms, which are specialized rooms, and the OT. So this became a completely sterile zone. The lowermost portion had the radiation treatment for cancer. This was a cancer hospital, and the radiation treatment has to be put in the basement because the radiation has to be controlled. I cannot have it in the normal area. So it was put underground, so much easier to handle. Okay, so that's how we zoned it vertically. 
horizontally and also made sure the critical sterile zones are all easily accessible and easily separable. Okay, so that was the primary consideration in designing this hospital. So this is how we went about zoning it. So these became the public zones. People can move in definitely in the ground level over here and the basement and the first level. Second level also is semi-public and the uppermost level became private in terms of sterility. There were specialized rooms which are post-operative in other rooms and a nuclear, nuclear medicine was accommodated over here. We did a dialysis as part of the OP over here. They also needed dialysis to be done. So that's how we went about doing that particular zoning. I am not going into detailed site plan because it's, it's not so easy to do this design. It had its own flaws, problems and pluses. I will tell you as I show you the next slide. So these give you an image of how the hospital interior looks. See, this is where I want to stress functionality was the primary aspect, but even at the second year of my practice, I thought that a hospital is not only being functional in terms of uh, a hospital, it has to be energy efficient. We were lucky, like I told you, north and south sides were the long sides, great ventilation, great lighting, you can see. But what we did was having a doubly loaded corridor. This is a central corridor, doubly loaded corridor. Normally you don't get light into these corridors, but by interspacing these staircase ports and having glazing along these sides, we let in a lot of light into the zones over here. That is why this picture is showing you how it happened. This is a core, light is coming from the uh, glazing here. Similarly, there's another core over there, light is coming. So the corridor became a more cheerful corridor, okay, in terms of light and ventilation. Then we went on to give a, a special feel to the hospital interior for two reasons. Most hospitals have problems of people getting stressed out, okay? So this natural light and ventilation relieves that problem. The color schemes we used are very muted. This is Jess Elmer yellow and black trims. This is aquamarine blue and white walls. Generally, the color schemes are muted. This is all in the basement that you see. This is also in the basement. This is a uh, corridor in a floor. Every floor had a different color scheme. Again, why? Most people tend to find uh, Wayfinding is very difficult in hospitals. They get confused. And that is why they end up in wrong places. They should not be there. They are there. This is not my floor. How do I go to my floor? Okay. So what we did was we talked about a color scheme for each floor. This is yellow and black. They sell me yellow, golden yellow. The next floor had peach and black. The floor above had green, more to do with nature. Okay. That was one thing we did for recognizing color or recognize, recognizing the floors. Each core area, I'm sorry, I don't have a picture of that, had a painting going from ground floor to top floor. So when you walk along the core, you see this painting continuously when you walk along. So one core had the sun, birds, and other things which are related to general horizon. The second core had a tree with leaves, birds, and other things which are, again, nature-oriented. The third core had everything to do with water, the seabed, the creatures in the seabed, and then move on to the sun at the surface of the wall. All these are very pleasant kind of uh, paintings which were given over there, but also identifies which core they are in. See, this is how we tried uh, wayfinding very easy, made wayfinding very easy. People actually came back to us and told us, students who have studied the hospital have, have told us it's very clear to find out things over here. Okay, so that's what's the plus in this design. Okay, there was uh, uh, a minus which we learned later the hard surfaces in almost all the, these areas had some openings. These areas were all closed, glazing, ventilators, uh, sorry, Venetian blinds are all metallic, hard walls. The sound was a problem. Okay, I will tell you at the end of the project why I consider this a problem. Too noisy, people were disturbed, all those kind of things. Okay, all these areas had hard time. So subsequently, we thought about it in various hospitals and we did things, but it's not always that you have your way because client has a say in the matter. Yes, we try to do things the way it should be. Okay. okay, you see these paintings here also are relief features. We made paintings to suit them. Every floor had a different theme. This painting are birds of India. The next was brides of India or dances of India. The next painting had some other sequence. Each floor identifies itself, gives it relief for people 
and it's informative also. Okay, so it, it's a it's a theme that we try to work on. Okay, this is phase one. The phase two Kamakshi Hospital. I go into detail. How did I arrive at the design? Okay, first again, the the site was two and a half acres or two acres. We couldn't do it as one site because if I take it as one site, the government takes away ten percent of the land, the total land. You have to give it away to the government. Okay, so we decided that we divided into two sites which the client did not want to part with the land. So we did this as a property and the setbacks are six meters again or seven meters in this case because we planned this for a high rise building, multi-story. Okay, And then we put the setbacks lines. What we did next was we identified certain structures we have already located here because the phase one had problems of space. We had located the services like the EV rooms, the transformer, the medical gas piping the fire sump, the main sump, all that. And then we took the piping from here. So we kept it away and then made the footprint smaller. The yellow is the footprint over here. And now we found out the building width is 45 to 50 meters. And as an energy efficient building, it doesn't work because the internal spaces don't get light. So we cut out a courtyard in between, a long courtyard, saying this will be free, okay? So we did that cutout. And then we came about with this design. Even here, we found that, okay, if I have a cutout over here, if I am here, I can move across here. If I am here, where do I move across? I have to walk either here or here. The walking distance became too long. So then we connected it to the center over here and had two courtyards. See how the design evolved based on criteria of uh, climate, energy, movement, everything, okay? So that's how it evolved. And then we went on to zone the building like the way we zoned the other building, very similar kind of zoning. We located circulation cores, green ones here, and then we added fire and exits for emergency. So these are circulation and service, circulation and service, circulation and service. So that's how the building form came about. Okay, then we went on to, this gives you an idea of how the building was located and formed. We conceived this as a complete, uh, landscape courtyard which will admit light and ventilation and also have become a buffer space for people to move into these space so there's an external access at the ground level a visual access from the upper levels to activity going on okay so this also is a stress buster it relieves stress for people at the upper levels and at low levels so this is something we did so energy was a factor lighting and ventilation productivity in terms of people, how they feel, how they work, how they react to the space is what we did over here by introducing courtyards with nature and views. And then this buffer space is an activity space also at the ground. level. So this gives you a fair idea of what happens in section, wind movement, light and all that really happens in this building. It is not uh, in theory. You can go there and find out how it happens. There is a problem there also, I will tell you at the end. Okay, so this tells you about light, not lighting, not side, south lighting. There is shadow from this building, but yes, there is enough lighting and how we had created that linear effect and the courtyard. Okay, <clears throat> okay this gives you a feel of the light itself, intensity, not Lavande, less heat, but light right across. South Lavande, little more heat, it has to be shaded, but light right across. So it's a good uh, uh, design in terms of lighting, ventilation, frost, all that can happen. Okay, zoning. How did you go about the zoning? I'm showing it to you in 3D. The ground floor had the main entry, the double story atrium, a large dining space with a kitchen for both visitors as well as staff. Then this had beds and the rear portion had parking area, still parking. There is outside parking, but the still parking for staff and other people was also in the space. The first floor is mostly beds, but we had a dialysis area because people will come on a daily basis, access it and go away the same day. So the dialysis was kept over there. Second floor, fully bed with special ward. I'll show you in the plan. The third floor had the main sterile areas on the south side. Why did we choose this side? Why not the north side? Okay. So the north side, we kept it for rooms. Why? Because the heat coming from there is definitely lesser. The, uh, the views are, were better. It was marshland, but definitely the view was better. Uh, this is a controlled space because I need to do air conditioning. I need to have it closed. Everything is controlled. So instead of having a controlled space over here, I put it over here because here the heat control is more difficult, but it's already a controlled space. So I put the entire, as a firm, we do this, okay? So we put the entire sterile zone and the OT on this block and it became very uh, easy. 
Accordingly, we located the CSST at the ground floor over here. Okay. So the CSST became part of this area over here. Ab above that is the O2. So that's how the zoning happened over here. So the horizontal and the vertical zoning is shown in a three dimensional fashion over here. So you understand it. Okay. This is the picture showing up the same section. Okay. Let's go to the ground floor plan. Entry, waiting. This is the double story reception, which gives you a grander entry. Many people liked it. I also felt for a large hospital with so much of people coming in and going, a double story entry would really do great uh, volume for the space, feel of the space. This is the staff and the uh, canteen for the visitors. You can step out into the courtyard. This was originally Kalingir, beds, etc. Now it's become pharmacy and other things related to the OP. And this is the parking. They had a um, machine to produce a radioactive substance for PET scan. The only one in Chennai at that point of time that was located here. Highly difficult to design and do this. It's very technical. So mostly it was done by the people who are coming with the equipment. This is the CSST directly below. So the cores, main core, secondary core, tertiary core, and the fire exit. Okay? Next floor, rooms. And this became the me uh, medical ICU. Okay? Why? It doesn't need to be next to the OT. It needs to be isolated. So we put it in the corner over there. The isolation room itself was put over here because patients can be brought, isolated, and kept over here. But after our design, we, we moved it towards this block for isolation subsequently and then got it over here because we found that there was a lot of movement. We moved it into this block. So these are some things which you learn on the way. This is the dialysis unit in the first floor. Movement is up from here and here, from the reception here. All people don't need to go through this. From the reception, they go on to the courtyard and then move up through this area. All toilets are here. All toilets are here. The next floor, we had all rooms and special rooms for VIPs with terrace gardens overlooking this. All rooms overlook into my courtyard. So they get connected. They get ventilation, lighting, and visually connected to various activities happening over there. This is the topmost floor where we had, I told you, the most sterile areas. The OT. Let me run through the OT for you. Patients brought in, sterile zone into the OT. Doctors come in, nurses come in, move, wash area. They come in from outside, wash area, move into the sterile area. Similarly, nurses do the same thing. Similarly, there's another facility for these two OTs over there. So nobody crosses path. Sterility movement is there. All dirty material comes out into the dirty corridor behind from the uh, OTs. There is a dumb waiter. All are collected, taken down through the dumb waiter, and it goes down to the CSST below. Post operative ward, after they finish, they come here, and the ICU, there's an NICU and a, and a NICU ward over here, pediatric ward. And uh, this is a specialty for this hospital because their department here was very strong. So they went about doing this on a large scale. Normally, people don't do this on such a large scale for this hospital. Okay. okay. That's the whole zoning and how it was done rooms generally these are hospital rooms are very akin to hotel rooms how did we segregate them and do it um, we as a team don't believe in artificial ventilation it's, it's all cost okay so i don't put my toilets inside the corridor space though it is convenient for various reasons i feel long term it's better to have it over here so the smaller rooms had a very very minimum window four feet wide to look outside light and ventilation are fine the toilets are accessed from here. So the room becomes this area. You have a main bed and attendance bed. This is a slightly larger room in length. This is the smallest room available. Okay, this is two grids into two rooms. But what we did for a little larger uh, room where they wanted to have a deluxe kind of room, we took three grids. Each grid became a room, not like having a toilet. The toilet became common over here. This is becoming one toilet for them, one toilet for them. There is a separate space where I have storage, etc. The attender has a better space. There's a wash area outside. All that happens over here. Okay? And in this particular space, you see the difference in the corridor. There's a 2.5, 2.5 corridor, but I have a tucked in seating where people who are waiting can sit here. They don't need to sit on the corridor. So the movement is much easier for the trolleys. People sitting here will sit here. Plus we have footwear spaces. Otherwise, all the footwear will be lying in the corridor. So we have certain areas of footwear. They keep the footwear and go into the room. So this is how we differentiated them. If you see the room itself, they have a shaft for the plumbing. The shaft is be itself becoming a space for cutting out light, 
it gives in recessed window, so it becomes a nice space. And these shots are at every, uh, it can be done at every grid. My grids were diff little different. They were 10 or three meter grids here. Sometimes we use six meter grids also, okay? So these shafts become plumbing shafts, so I can put in toilets where I want, when I want. Tomorrow, if I change the layout of the room, any room will have a shaft. There's a room shaft, there's a shaft. All this can be flexible. So that's how we worked out the design, okay? Topmost floor. Okay, so this particular hospital was designed after the first phase, and it had taken out a lot of problems which we had over there. Yes, this became a problem, I, I think, there was a problem over here in the sense that they paved this area, they covered it, and they had a lot of other issues relating to that. Okay? The courtyard we envisaged was a landscape courtyard. Now it is no more a landscape courtyard. It's a paved courtyard. It is highly, highly inhospitable. It is hot because it's open. With the, they have covered it with a plexiglass cover. All that was done later. They thought that they were doing a great job. You can't sit in that courtyard. Okay. So now I'm suggesting I go there for treatment also. So I suggested to them to redo that place and they are going to do it more as a plantation area with a little ventilation. Okay. Then we go on to uh, another hospital, which is a government hospital. What I did was the first two are independent and a single block almost. Then we went on to, we're going to show you how we worked a similar kind of design for a government hospital and how we achieved everything in a larger scale. The same light and ventilation, the same courtyards, the same kind of greenery access, all that is possible, even when you do it on a larger scale without compromising on uh, your uh, functionality. Okay, So this is for the Kanjiburam uh, Cancer Hospital, house embedded. Originally, they had this hospital. Okay, sorry. Originally, they had this as a hospital, very unorganized but very successful in terms of people. A lot of people come here for treatment. Uh, uh, so it's a famous hospital, right? So they wanted to add thousand beds. So they had asked us to do it. So we studied and found out there was an area here and an area here. We said we will keep this because there were a lot of trees for palliative care. And then we made this into the hospital zone because easy access, easy access from here. Everything worked out very well over here. Okay? So we went about doing the hospital in this particular zone with a separate access and a connectivity from here. Okay. Overall, this is the way we approached it. Why it turned out to be like this? The MD of the particular department uh, had his own views on a hospital. He wanted a modern hospital, but he wanted it in a pentagon shape. Okay. So uh, we tried telling him, but then he said pentagon. So then we said, let's see how we can work a pentagon into a hospital shape. This is inspiration for him from the Pentagon FBI headquarters. We worked a pentagonal shaped hospital without actually compromising on most of the things. If you see this module over here, it is very similar to the module we designed in our second project. Okay, it's got the 15 meter bay, 15 meter uh, courtyard and a 15 meter bay with, with this becoming light and ventilation for most of the spaces and a recreation, not a recreational space, a relief space for this particular unit. Each of these units are done that way. We have a pentagonal central atrium. This I deliberately did not keep it open because this is where all my circulation happens. I'll tell you how. Okay. And each side of this pentagon has this block attached to it. Okay. After having done all this, we still had problems of working out various areas. So we created another peripheral block, also a 15 meter block with a courtyard in the center between the main and this. So this became another 15 meter wrap around, okay, which had other facilities. That's how this was conceived. Okay, let's go on to the planning of what actually we did. It is an isometric view. The front block had main entry over here. All blocks at the upper three levels had rooms, okay, where patients are housed, private rooms, paid rooms. All those are in the upper level because they need privacy. How did we segregate? They had very clear segregation, very easy segregation. Surgical oncology, this is a cancer treatment. Surgical oncology is one block where surgery happens. Only for these people, they suggest surgery. So they're all put in this block and OTs are all located over here. Medical oncology, all general wards are located over here. Most general wards are patients and then there are medical treatment happening, private wards on top. 
Similarly, over here, this is radiation oncology. This is the treatment itself, radiation therapy, chemotherapy, uh, uh, radiation therapy, brachy, linear accelerator, all these are radiation oriented. They are all housed here. The radiation is in the basement. Then there are wards over here. So again, specific requirement, specific zoning. This became the OP block, very close to the entry, and rooms on top. So the zoning was based on that. Where did all the diagnostics, etc., go? Okay, so that's what we need to see. The front end had the pharmacy, palliative care, etc. They had the public zones like auditorium, library, etc. The linking block here, the linking block here next to the OPD had all my diagnostics, lab, blood bank, all the diagnostics over here and bedrooms on top. Then the, the linking block here at the ground floor had a canteen and other facilities for public. From there on, on top we had, there. this is also a teaching hospital, so there are rooms for all the HODs, classrooms and all that happened over here. This had links to the OT and other facilities. So the ICU beds, wards for that, pediatric ICU and casualty happened over here. See how the zoning plays around depending on type of hospital, the need for what you have to do, and your concept. So this concept was told to us to be in this form. So we adapted ourselves to this form. Okay? So the basement floor, you come from the ground floor, go down through the core, enter into the common area, which is the lobby. No light or ventilation in this case, because this is in the basement. Why? Because all these are radiation equipment. We suggested they take it to the basement. They were not for it. Then they found out from various areas, it's better to be in the basement. So we went for the basement. So they have their uh, consultancy here. All the treatment consultancy happens here. And then they are sent in to various treatment areas, waiting along with the treatment area. These are the linear activity. Look at the size of the walls, etc. They are custom made to prevent radiation from going out. They are to be cleared by the Baba Atomic Research Center, Mumbai. Okay, So that happens. This is also treatment area. Then we go to the ground floor. This is the main entry. One block itself at the ground floor became the main entry where you can actually, uh, we can actually enter park and then come into the anti space, get into a lobby. There's a main lobby over here. From here, you can, you can have the reception, etc. over here. There's a pharmacy and there are offices over here, admin offices. So public area are curtailed. The pharmacy itself is over there. Once they get into the hospital, you have a main vertical circulation. There's another vertical circulation when you're on the rear side of the hospital. Don't need to walk up. This yellow portion is where I will let my people move. Okay. I am curtailing them from moving to any other portion by design. So they move around over here. If he has to go to OP, enters. If he has to go to the radiation block, enters. If he has to go to the medical block, enters. OT block, enters. Surgical block. Okay. So I don't need people moving beyond this. If I need to move up and down, I either move from here, which is the best possible, they move up from here, and then go to the various flows. Again, they move around this entire circulation zone and enter the block only where they are required. See how isolation happens. Circulation is a key in hospitals to isolating patients. First. Okay, the biosecurity can happen. I can first, I have to isolate patients, I mean, visitors and patients and movement. Okay, that's what happens over here. So waiting areas are all in these areas and they move. They have their own waiting areas in each of these places. That's how it's been segregated. What we also did was, if I have this as the only movement, I keep moving up and down. So we link blocks through another movement corridor, which is adjoining this 15 meter bay, which we have linking all these. Places. So creating this secondary courtyard, all these green spaces where light will come, ventilation will come, people can be able to do and move over there. So the canteen block has an outdoor seating, etc. So we created these spaces to have outdoor visual spaces, outdoor mobile spaces, and courtyards which create visual link and light. That's how we created the atmosphere for these people who use this. Okay? So I'm running through the rest of the flows, not going to be very difficult. Okay, there are core areas here also. The connectivity in the corridor, I don't want to have a core here. Then people will start walking. So I come, move up. I come, move up. See how easily you can do these. Okay, so this happens. Every floor is the same. The upper floor here have auditorium and other palliative care beds. Then we move on to the regular room floors. Types of rooms are very similar to the other blocks. 
the uh, the ot complex is this area again very similar to the other day okay these are the views of what uh, we envisage as a, as an external view two reasons why they 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 don't want to spend too much money one uh, number two as a firm we don't use too much glass and acp and things like right? we feel the climate demands local materials better control of climate less amount of glass which works better for the building interior itself so we work with local materials either plastered and painted or sometimes we use cladding material where as essentially maintenance required mostly this cladding material is done at the ground level so that it's maintainable by itself that is why it gets dirty the upper portions don't get dirty so easily okay okay these are some views of the entire hospital itself the way it is designed and that's the overall view okay having told you about how a single building a block building and then a whole campus of a uh, building it's a cluster it's not like separate block that was clustered we go on to the next this becomes an actual campus why an actual campus because this is a larger site and the need demanded it okay this is for institute of mental health this is where this is in kilpock mentally ill patients after treatment they go over here and they recuperate over here. if they get better they go back home this is where they are housed okay so this had a 25 acre property which is a kind of virgin land but it had buildings scattered which are already existing over there currently being used as wards lots of small small buildings scattered i don't know how it happened but it happened but they had a major administrative complex over here which we thought should be maintained and used as a major focus the main road led to that two new building blocks have been put over here which we were told not to do anything with we they will utilize it these are defunct right now and they wanted to use new uh, new blocks for 1000 inmates there's an op op site over here which is across the road which is separate okay so this is an op block over here so what we did we understood the requirement 1000 beds dining why do you need uh, i mean this place to be more recreational because they are not patients they are come here to recuperate okay so they have finished treatment but yes they go through a recuperating process therapy is there all that happens So we thought it should be more recreational in terms of space. Okay, then therapy spaces are there, examination and counselling. These are the primary requirements. How did we go about it? We observed the site. The main road I told you is the main axis. Existing building was there, the admin building. There were existing wards, and there was a dense green cover. Okay, I'd like to go back to the slide and show you lots of good trees. A lot of them fell down during the Tane Puyal, but still lots of trees. I went there after that. there are some pockets of places where trees had gone down in these places and they had died so there were a lot of open spaces in this area a little bit over here and a large one over here okay but then we went on to zone it very differently how they had an architect architectural significance the buildings were existing were old they had tiled roofs they had colonnaded corridors we thought we will make use of the feel what is existing over there and go around with the same feel we retain these buildings overall design we wanted to keep the place green and design only in open pockets enhancing the architectural significance along the main axis and cluster planning why we we'll go to that okay so option 1 this is one cluster how to arrive at this they wanted us to have a space where people felt free the inmates felt free to move around and do right now what happens is if they have to go from their ward to somewhere else to for treatment or counseling they have to be accompanied by a person who takes them a staff okay so they are walked around from here to it's a very very tedious process so they wanted to accommodate all that in one block or one cluster and make them walk around by themselves so that independence starts growing on them and then they will go out but they have to be monitored you can't let them walk around by themselves because we don't know what they will do they may just go out and slowly walk wherever they want and go away So that was a main criteria in how we went about designing. Okay, so the site plan we came about with this main axis and the main focus of the administration. We had this open spaces were more here. We housed the male wards over here, the female ward was housed over here, and around the admin because daytime therapy also happens. People might come here. We had occupational therapy building for you. Okay, future expansions can happen in this fashion. Here also it can happen in this fashion over here. 
these are the existing buildings, the kitchen and laundry was here. Okay, so we cut off the services here. From there, they are distributed. Outside agencies stop till here. All these are in turn. Okay, how did we arrive at the design? Yes, we used a hexagonal thing because we wanted to have an introverted uh, design for monitoring purposes. We need to understand how they are, where they are, what they are doing, all those things. Okay, so the circular thing is the best thing for an internal focus. We converted that into a hexagon. Then we made the usable spaces uh, like a donut around the hexagon. And then we added this portion beyond the hexagon. We added this portion to it extended it for the bed capacity okay so that's how we arrived at this that's how we arrived at this form so this is what we do at the rear there are two wards then there are other facilities like dining toilets etc and there are facilities where doctors will come see how we zoned it once you enter you go through your area this becomes private the next slide will explain it better okay so each zone was i have an entry Therapy, consulting, and examination. The doctor stops here. Doctors don't go beyond this. Okay, so people come and they get examined and go. Then there are wards all around, plus the toilet facility for each ward. They have a dining facility for each of these areas. Okay, so these dining facilities will have access from the rear for supply of food from the central kitchen. This courtyard becomes a space where people can come. They can do their activity, whatever they want. They're free to do whatever they want because it's easily monitored from wherever people are, okay? That's how this unit was designed. See how the cluster was designed? We added the units again in a hexagonal manner, left one for the opening. So this became the main central focus and subsidiary central space, okay? So how spatially they move from one space to another is the feel. In this case, all these courtyards are usable courtyards for whatever purpose they can do agriculture they can do planting they can do play they can do activities such as uh, uh, dramas etc entertainment all that can happen here yeah? monitoring is very easy because one entry and one more monitoring space over here so freedom of movement at the same time easy to monitor okay that's what we try to do over there that's how it turned out as a proposal it's a ground floor structure option two we worked a little differently to have a little more extroverted kind of feel okay so not like too much of an introverted feel similar kind of layout okay how did we arrive at this the blocks were all rectangular blocks around an octagonal kind of central covered space this is not an open space here the dining and nurse station happens over here and from here i can step out into this but the only thing i curtail this space so people can use these outdoor spaces, but with curtailment here also, they will have a curtailment. So then combining them to form a unit, which has got a larger interaction space over here, outdoor. This is more of an indoor focus space. So that's what we did. Similar kind of layout, the rooms, the toilets, and all the doctor spaces are over here. The dining space became the central space, okay? So this is where they would dine. So all, all these, uh, Spaces have worked out with keeping their visual connectivity and a physical connectivity to outdoor spaces in mind. Okay. Okay. So this is how it finally would have. They are yet to start this work, but the Anna uh, Cancer Hospital has already started and they're proceeding. Okay. So having done this, okay, I go on to the conclusion almost. Okay. So what do we do? What did we do different in terms of design in these cases? We designed functional spaces, yes, easy for hospitals to function. But the problem with most hospitals, like I told you, is wayfinding and people are stressed out inside a hospital. No natural light, no visual connectivity to the outside, noise, smell. So what we worked on was we tried to work on a sensory uh, solution, okay, where we thought we will give them more visual treat. Uh, 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 a sound also should be controlled. Smells also can be controlled. All these things we try to work on by opening out spaces to nature. Okay, that's what we did. Most of our spaces can be naturally ventilated. They don't need AC. So a lot of rooms in the Kamachi Memorial Hospital don't have AC. They have two floors of non-AC and two floors of AC. That is, people who demand for an AC flow, they give them an AC flow. Otherwise, you don't need AC. 
light is not required, so they really save on energy bills, etc. The feel of the hospital is more open, more relaxed, and people feel more comfortable in these atmospheres. Okay? So somebody asked the question of design response to pandemic uh, condition. Should we go to this or the take questions afterwards? Okay. Yeah, we can because this is also a part of the question. Also, yeah, so okay. we'll, uh, go along. So this this is what we listen out. Okay. Normally, when I uh, I do thesis with students, uh, generally we try to. A lot of people have taken up this pandemic thing as a response uh, for various spaces like office spaces, etc. But it all ended up to be not a spatial difference, not an organizational difference, but differences of uh, what you call as active techniques rather than passive techniques. Okay. So move the table, put a screen in front. Yes, these are good at a subject. How do you how do you avoid doing these things as add-ons is what we thought about. Okay. The first thing, somebody was very right. I appreciate the thought process that somebody said. Standards have to be re-looked into. Okay. It's a it's a it's a basic thing. I think we have moved from being uh, uh, the dinosaur era to the digital era. Even now, actually, the standards haven't changed. Okay, we still work with standards which are old. Office standards are still uh, at 10 square meter per person and things like that. Whereas your space in an office has become smaller. Storage has become smaller. You don't have file storages. Your computer is the only space you require. Okay, and everything has become more compact. Your communication, your meeting rooms, everything has changed right now. So spatial standards will change, especially for the pandemic. It becomes more now. Why? Earlier, when you could accommodate 50 people, today you can accommodate 25 people. Distancing, social distancing. So I think if you start looking at the spatial standards, we would be more successful in designing for pandemic conditions. Okay? So that is a primary thing which has to change. Second thing, the facilities management standards. Okay? No more, the AC itself is questionable. Why should I have an air-conditioned space? Okay, Can I have naturally ventilated spaces? Because AC causes infection to be transferred, which is known. Everybody knows it. It's just that we have become aware of it because of the pandemic. You go in an AC office or an AC car, somebody has got a flu or cough. I bet that within two days, somebody else in the car will have it. But we didn't bother because flu and cough is normal. But we are bothered now because this is a death penalty almost. Okay, so I can't be sitting next to and breathing the same air with a COVID patient is what made us change our idea. So do we need to go to the drastic end? Can we design normal buildings to be better uh, in standards and spaces and in terms of facilities? Okay. Second, design of furniture, I thought, instead of just putting glasses in front and doing things, the furniture design itself, today two feet is the width of most furniture, but when somebody stands in front of you, he's breathing in your face. Okay. So how do I make it different? Okay. So do I, how do I make people stand away from my furniture or where I am going to work? This, is, has to, this has to be looked into, especially at a reception or a meeting hall. So how do you now start, look at furniture? It becomes different. You can't sit facing each other, opposite each other in these conditions. So design of furniture itself changes. Maybe the size of furniture will change. It may not depend on what you need to do on the tabletop. It may depend on distancing also. So how do I work that? Okay, so that can be relooked at. Okay, then the AC itself. Relook at if you need to AC a space, air conditioner space. Relook the system of dispersing and collecting air condition air. What happens in OTs? They are doing it already, right? So they they discharge the air from the top. It moves down because it's heavier air goes down. Normally, what happens? Then it becomes hot and moves up and is collected up in normal spaces. But in OTs, it is discharged down and you collect it at the bottom. There is a one-way movement of air. All infection gets taken down and then collected. It doesn't travel through your face again. doesn't go up again. So can we look at air conditioning itself very differently okay, to ensure that dispersion and collection takes away the contamination easily. That is one way. Then you can increase the number of changes, air changes specified for a space. They do 15 to 20 air changes for kitchen. Why? Smell, uh, oil, all that has to be taken away. It should not be there, heat. So our air changes are hardly one air change or two air changes per hour. So can I look at better air changes? 
natural ventilation can can even achieve that if you do it properly okay so the number of air changes you do in a room so that the infected air particles get taken away sooner i'm not saying it's going to be taken away immediately sooner it's not standing in the thing okay then replicate fire zones i don't know if you know about fire zones ac is usually designed based on fire zones also because one of the main reasons of fire spreading is through ac ducts okay so how do you do it you put an ahu and that handles one zone so that zone if something catches fire if it is not curtailed only that zone will burn it will not transfer to the next zone through the ac can we do something like that for isolation of zones okay so these are important aspects that we should consider okay revision of norms for medical gas supply provision actually your sizing of a medical gas unit has to change now it's no more going to be the sizing that they have already because that was on older norms with pandemic etc the whole thing has to be relooked because today we were found wanting in terms of quantity everybody knows that right so we are running health as health so that has to change so number num the provision for the sizing of this secondly outlets itself why even the icus were short uh, shortfall so why it's a shortfall i don't have outlets for uh, oxygen i don't have outlets for uh, ventilators there are no equipment so how do i manage these things in terms of numbers has to change so the standards have to be definitely increased you can't have the whole hospital on standby but the definitely the standards have to change so these are some ways and means of doing uh, what do you call as isolation social distancing all these can happen through design features so we should be able to implement them and convince people okay so that's the basic and the response in terms of design to the hospital building itself like i told you should not be only on function i talked to you about a lot of functional aspects but as architects is it good just to do a functionally good hospital all hospitals designed today are functionally fine do you feel comfortable in these hospitals how many of us feel the hospitals are places where we get stressed out more also if we go okay so how can you make them is what we need to address and that's what we we showed you how we address by bringing in natural elements nature more air movement distraction easy mobility easy understanding of space okay way finding all these are tactics of keep, keeping people a little less stressed out if you're going around trying to find space and you're losing time that means you're getting stressed out in time, okay and when you're sitting does uh, abroad they have a lot of facilities which are for common people inside a hospital they share facilities with the community okay so what do they do they they bring in the community to share certain facilities they have spas etc so people who are going to be a long time they don't need to hang around they don't have any other work can use other facilities also okay so those are some things that we need to look at in terms of de stressing people inside hospitals as an architectural space i'm going to uh, go to the next slide which shows you some quotations by various architects as how they see building we have been taught to see buildings as a, a built form which should look beautiful which should be functional okay that's how we have been so here it is about how we see buildings how we e building is what we look at but these architects have a different view it's what we try to do in most of our places the successful or not only people who use the building have to say okay so peter zumthor daniel leibskin steven hall and yohani palas what is common among all these people they are all phenomenologists okay what is phenomenology it's about making people feel something an emotion inside buildings making people feel the space you have created not just see it seeing is one way of feeling it but there are four other senses how do we make them feel the space or how do we make them um, experience what you are trying to give them inside is what these people try to do i think a hospital can become an experiential space in terms of at least feeling de stress you don't need to feel uh, something outside of the hospital happening inside the hospital but you should feel not uh, de stress inside i mean you should feel not stressed inside the hospital. you should feel a little more relaxed in hospital mentally you are there but yes 
i i cannot make myself stressed out so much how do i as an architect or we as architects make that happen so some of the quotations architecture is not about form okay he insists architecture is about feel the next statement says that my building should have an emotional core a space in itself has emotional nice feeling i don't know if many of you are aware of these this this uh, architect he's designed mostly small buildings okay his experimentation has been on small buildings like chapels uh, the term, the term is spa the spa space in each of these spaces he uses uh, he uses the local materials texture smell color everything to make person feel an emotion inside his building so he says every building he says has to have a soul this is something i think we should think about we have a soul okay if a building has a soul to to extend to interact with the building other than just see it okay that's what they trying to do okay daniel lipskin he says design is as important to where and how we live as it is for museums and concert halls we all think only those spaces are to be designed beautifully are to be designed interactive all those things but what about the places where you live what about places where you work you don't need so many hospitals and uh, uh, spas and therapeutic centers if the places where we live and work are healthy by themselves okay so that's something that he he says design is as important to where and how we live not only to museum concept okay architecture is bound to a situation this is even hall so it is a metaphysical link okay so he is also a phenomenologist who experiments with sensory architecture and lastly yohani palasma very interesting i can see i see the task of architecture as the defense of authenticity of human experience he says there is no no authentic experience that buildings give nowadays okay buildings are made as interactive pieces visually can i make it an experience okay so i must make most of the spaces that we design as an experience is what we say so with this i leave you to ponder these thoughts and don't think of the building as a building it is an experiential space please understand we as architects don't design just buildings we design experiential spaces thank you and i welcome all your questions thank you sir thank you for the wonderful uh, presentation so i think now it's time for the participants to ask their questions so you may post your questions in the chat box or you may also unmute yourself and ask the questions yeah there are two questions in the chat box but i like somebody to ask i want to i want to interact right <laughs> participants you may my experience here has been only uh, talking okay i need to hear yeah somebody wants to talk please there are three questions waiting anyway so let's see i think they have asked you directly sir uh, it is not uh, in the common uh, oh. can i ask you a question sir yes please uh, my name is ram ji yes sir uh, uh, uh very informative presentation my my uh, question would be uh where do you think hospitals will be you know say 5 or 10 years from now uh when you see technology being a major disruptor these days uh you know uh, what will be the role of hospitals would you think uh you know uh, because as they say I, I, and i can see what a bank has become these days you hardly find anybody in a bank Do you think uh, you know less and less people in a hospital or you know what how do you see this healthcare scenario evolving no yeah it's a good uh, thought process uh, but i don't think uh, linearly we can connect it with the, what is happening in a bank etc okay there mm-hmm. it is more of more of a product here it is more of uh, you as uh, mm-hmm. uh, being a, a healthy individual okay if if uh, if i were to answer the first portion of your question um, where would my hospital be future if things go as per what uh, these people are talking about and it becomes a, every space that we design becomes an experiential or a space where people can actually live better or feel the space better uh, i think the 
the need for hospitals will only go down why do we need so many hospitals now is because due to the technology itself we are not becoming any more relaxed okay we mm-hmm. go to relax to certain places and we uh, we are creating more product space i need relaxation i go to a spa i need relaxation i go to a center where they offer me stress management okay whereas whereas if most of our spaces are actually spaces where i can relax myself meaning like mentally the stress levels will not be so high okay we have brought upon the stress levels to ourselves with technology yes technology must happen but at at the peril of what is what i would like to question okay yeah, uh, technology in hospitals okay yes whether people will go to hospitals for doing things most probably it will happen uh, because at the rate we are going we are only inviting trouble okay we are we are inviting more uh, invasions into our bodies we are inviting more problems by not uh, uh, being one with nature okay i think uh, that is something which has happened over a period of time a lot of people are realizing that uh, we have moved away from nature at our own peril they will move towards it technology is not a uh, not a hindrance it should be there uh, like for example the hospital space itself could become smaller or less attenders required if automated automation happens okay yes like you, you are you are going in you are screened you can go in you know no need people to even address you over there like in airports okay so that can happen in hospitals too okay so you are there is nobody to take your temperature there is no need to take your weight all that can happen as you walk into a hospital okay so that is one portion of it then the treatment aspect itself is going to become more uh, uh, more uh, it's it's going to become invasive but done by lesser uh, people and more uh, robotics okay so that's going to happen over a period of time mm-hmm. but whether they need to come to a hospital yes i think it's going to happen from what we are seeing now it's going to happen more often okay thank thanks you. ramji thank, thank you, you. uh there's another question uh, will color play a major role while designing a hospital as healing entity when compared to open spaces and internal spatial entities yes color does have a role like uh, i told you some i showed you some photographs in the first uh, case study we consciously made uh, a color scheme like i told you for each floor one it offers a distraction okay you're not uh, uh, you're not like uh, seeing the same thing through and through a lot of hospitals tend to give that feel you are facing the same thing through and through you're not uh, changing your mindset it becomes very depressing okay but a lot of people play with color uh, indiscriminately which may not uh, be the right way soothing colors colors which are more placative these are all part of uh, studying in interior and color schemes right so that definitely plays a role Okay. there are specific colors which are to be done with the specific colors which are not to be done so you don't uh, end up doing strong accent colors uh, on a lot yes soothing and placating colors are much more needed for our patients there is another question uh, how do you think uh, unaclo methods could influence a hospital design i didn't get that how do you think unaclo methods could influence a hospital design Okay, vernacular. This topic is itself a <laughs> um, traditional vernacular. Would actually go back to uh, how traditionally things were done. Okay, vernacular. Okay, I'll give you an example. Uh, I, there is a hospital in Chennai. It's called the Kalyani Hospital. Okay, it's in Radha Krishnan Salai. I have been to the hospital. It is typically a single-story structure. Uh, low proof courtyards and all uh, happens only uh, l- like a typical uh, traditional building i found that uh, atmosphere uh, very very uh, nice okay definitely much much better than most of the hospitals that we go to maybe the hospitals today are more commercial and they not designed uh, as space as a major thing there they had space it was an old building the feeling was very nice so definitely the uh, the vernacular aspect of that space also added to the ambiance but i really feel the spatial aspect was what was more nicer over there so i would tell you uh, you take the traditional vernacular techniques and uh, 
um, things that they adapted uh, uh, to do spaces for a certain reason and apply it to your design. So I would say more than vernacular, it's uh, it's critical regionalism which is more important. You take the traditional methods and the techniques and apply it to a modern context and make sure that you are fitting into the zone, the climate itself. So that's that's a more apt way of doing it. Critical regionalism would be a better uh, way of looking at it. Yes, if you feel visually you need a space to look vernacular, we tried it at the mental hospital space. I, I thought it was working fine over there. So definitely it can work on certain apps. Another question is, uh, in hospital, as we are concentrating more on the incoming people on design aspects, uh, we may also uh, must consider uh, designing good spaces to the working people in the hospital. So the stress for them could be less. Yes, I think a uh, very, very uh, pertinent point. Um, how, do you, how do you differentiate these two is very important, right? Uh, if I design a hospital, which uh, ambience-wise is good for the visitor as well as uh, uh, the um, inpatient, okay? doctors generally tend to move into these areas mostly. Okay? They are part of these areas mostly, except when they retire to their resting rooms and things like that. So if we design for this segment, I think the working segment also becomes uh, part of that uh, visual treat or uh, experiential treat. Okay? The, or the places where they are really under controlled atmosphere like a OT, becomes very critical. There, we tend to give a large open glass space for OTs for the sake of distraction because some operations go on for four hours. Okay? Distraction doesn't mean you're distracted from what you're doing. It's a relief to the mind. Okay? So if I can see something green or water or something happening, even kids playing outside, would actually make my mind a little bit less uh, stressful because the operation is a stressful process for the doctor too. Though it is kind of mechanical, they always meet uh, uh, certain uh, places where they have to overcome it, okay? So they, they get into a situation. So when they finish that successfully and they move on, they can actually look out or feel a little less uh, stress when they look out at something nicer. Right? So those kind of things have to happen even in theaters, though most doctors prefer not to have windows and openings in theaters. I really don't know why. We did it in a, a rural eye hospital in uh, UP where we had a large window. They liked it okay? because the doctor who went there is a traveling doctor. So he was already stressed because he travels through the night to come to operate. So he did, does 10 operations within an hour, 12 operations and then goes. So for him, he felt, he said, being in an enclosed place was really bad. This is much better. And many doctors feel Keeping an open space, uh, open window is not a great thing. So it's, it's how you convince them. But yes, they also need to be these steps. Uh, any more questions from the participants? Yes, sir. I have a doubt, sir. Yes. Sir, you had spoken a lot about sterilization of spaces and materials. But uh, what about the incineration part of uh, materials? So does it happen in the hospital or somewhere else? Uh, I didn't go into the services, okay, so that's, uh, you're right, because uh, I thought that's a topic which is very vast, okay. The incineration has to be done at hospitals. Uh, either they do it there or they send it as bio-waste, somebody comes and takes it and incinerates it. The most city hospitals, they give it to people who take it out, okay, they don't have space. Uh, it also becomes a problematic area because fumes will come out, people, you know, people around are very, very uh, suspicious of everything. So if you let out, if a hospital lets out drainage into an adjacent land, they can get, they get sued or they get uh, questioned because it is, they feel it is uh, toxic uh, drainage, okay? So they are right because uh, toxic uh, drainage is generated in hospitals. There are some radi radioactive substances, there are infectious things which go out. Similarly, these kind of things, if you get done right around residential zone, people don't feel comfortable. Even the fumes going up may not be a great... Uh, uh, thing for the people around. So city hospitals do it outside. They don't do it inside. Thank you, sir. Uh, any more questions? Okay, uh, I think uh, we have come to the end of the session, sir, and uh, it's time to thank you all. Though we have uh, exceeded the time limit, 
uh, the session was uh, interesting and informative. So on behalf of MSAJ, I extend a hearty thanks to architect Sharat uh, who has accepted our invite and uh, spent his efficient time in imparting his experience and knowledge to our students. Uh, this webinar was truly informative, sir. Uh, this will definitely help our students in their architectural design approach for the healing spaces. And uh, you ignited the quest for uh, knowledge and awareness about these uh, healing spaces, sir. Thank you, sir. Uh, sincere thanks to the management, principal, HOD, and faculty members. and. Uh, a boundless thanks to all the participants for joining us today uh, with attention and active participation with the questions. With these warm words, uh, we move to the end of uh, the session and uh, the close of today's webinar. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Thank you, you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Kelvi, for having me here. And thank you for the audience for a patient listening. I hope I have made a difference the way you think. Yes, sir. Definitely, as sir. Well as imparted something that you can think about. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you all. Yeah.